dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. Have you ever felt like you were in a box? Like no matter what you chose in life, there were already predetermined outcomes and there's nothing you could do that could change it? Few things will kill the heart and ability of a leader more quickly than fatalism. An attitude that says that it's not even worth trying because you won't make any difference. Funny thing is, we're not the first people to face fatalism. We're not the first people to face the boxes that life presents to us. True leaders find a way to become creative anyway. And Christian leaders become creative with Christ. Let's look at St. Paul as an example. Hey everybody, glad to be back with you again. And we're doing this uh, wonderful class here on St. Paul. Right? I want us to focus in together on understanding how St. Paul speaks to us who are business leaders, professional leaders, right, in the workspace, uh, and, and, and inspires us to do the great things that God's put into our hearts. I mean, just the St. John Leadership Network exists so that you can become the audacious leader, the daring leader that, that you want to be. Why would you live a life of mediocrity and not even living a life that you yourself want to live? I mean, in the end, if you're not happy with your own life, <laughs> I mean, then you need to get one, right? You need to get a new one. You, you need to do something because the one goal that we all have in life, the thing that we all need to achieve, no matter what, is to find the happiness on the other end of our actions, right? So if I'm therefore engaged in my profession and my profession is meaningless to me, you're probably actually hurting yourself, just to be honest. I mean, a, a person who spends years of their life consigned to a workspace or an environment or choices that don't allow them to flourish is literally spending years without flourishing. And you get to a point where we, if you don't flourish long enough, you end up forgetting that you're meant to flourish to begin with. You start dying instead of living. And it becomes harder and harder to crawl out of that space. It just becomes easier and easier to let whatever the, 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 the powers that be in your life have dictated as the parameters of your life, just to let them just stay, right? So if we're in a condition where, well, our children don't practice the faith anymore, well, I mean, there's nothing you can do, right? It is what it is. Well, I mean, it, it, at the beginning, it's good to say that. You have to cope with it, right? You can't sit there and beat yourself up or be full of guilt. But then, like, just to say it is what it is and it will always be that way, well, that's, that's the abdication of leadership, right? Leadership begins by someone who says, I want to make a change. I, I want to influence the environment around me. There's going to be an impact that I need to make. And if my kids aren't practicing the faith, well, I got to find somehow or other to try to influence that. I mean, saying it is what it is helps because then I'm like, okay, I mean, I can only do what I can do. I get it. But then I need to do what I can do. <laughs> And to do what I can do, I, I got to rediscover this, this thing I call Christian creativity. Right? Christian creativity doesn't mean that I think of all kinds of new ways to do things all the time. But it, what it does mean is that I'm going to find a way. There, there's a change that I dare to believe in. Go, I talked about your kids without your faith, but go to your marriage, your relationship with your spouse. I mean, do you want the next 10 years of your life to be like the last 10? If you want the next 10 years of your life to be like the last 10 years of your life, then you don't have to change anything, right? But if you're sitting there telling yourself, I wish I could do better. I would like to do better. I want to want to do better. Well, then odds are you're going to make it happen. In other words, the beginning of all acts of leadership, no matter how big or how small they are, is the desire that you have to move the needle forward, to attain a good that you do not yet have, to do something you have not yet done, to dream. And this is where your Christian faith, this is what it's all about. This is why we are Christians. Because when I look at Christ, I'm, I'm literally looking at someone who told me that nothing is impossible for you if you believe. It's a direct quote from Jesus Christ. 
Now, you can misinterpret that, right? You can try to apply it to all kinds of prosperity gospel messages or where get rich quick schemes. I, that's not what I'm talking about. That's, and that's not what he was talking about either. He was saying, when you've got your eyes on God and your heart on God and you're following God, then the great things that you want to dare for him are within your reach by his grace and his power. Nothing is impossible for God if we believe that he has the power and the desire to bring our desires to fulfillment when it comes to glorifying him. Right? So in other words, it's, it's, it's assuming that you're a good person. It's assuming that you're trying to do good things. But as I said, you are good people. And you are trying to do good things. And what you're trying to do is, is make the world better through your professions, through your companies, through your work experience, through putting your skills and your passions and your talents to the test every day by grinding to make something that hasn't existed before. I mean, you entrepreneurs that are out there, just tip of the hat to you. I mean, you're incredible people pushing in new departments, new, new expansions, trying to find ways to innovate in your technology to make the world a better place, trying to scale the business that you have. These are endeavors that don't have to be selfish. In fact, they can be extremely beneficial as gifts to the humanity, but it needs, uh, it needs a leader who's got that in their heart. This is where Christianity comes in. I think there's no better person to lead our businesses than saints. <laughs> I just say it over and over again. Just like there's no better people to lead our politics than saints. There's no better people to lead your families than saints. The problem is that the saints, for some reason, just are getting lazy today. I don't know what to say about it. But it's almost like we're like, well, I can't do anything about this or that. It's already predetermined. We got these investment companies that are doing all kinds of manipulations of ESG scores to put social pressure onto companies that then force and mandate things that I can't stand by, right? And so you're going to say, well, I can't do anything about that. I was like, well, that's kind of fatalistic, isn't it? I mean, you're not even going to try because you've already told me you're going to fail. Whatever happened to the dreamer who looked failure in the eye and then pushed past him anyway? You know, it's like that, that old quote that says, there's freedom waiting for you on the breezes of the sky. And you ask, what if I fall? But oh, my darling, what if you fly? Why am I so willing to let the outcomes other people have determined for me determine my own fate? Why am I so willing to follow the voices of negativity and, and of pessimism and, and, and of defeat in the end? I don't follow those voices. I follow Christ Jesus, our Lord, who I remind you happened to go through a, something that people thought was impossible. He was a man who dared the impossible. He, he, he was conceived as God in the womb of a virgin. That, that's impossible. And yet he did it. When his townsmen were going to throw him off of a cliff, he literally walked right through the midst and no one laid a hand on him. Three times he avoided imminent death. They had stones picked up and they didn't even throw them. I mean, it, that's impossible, but not for Christ. And he walked on water. You ever done that before? <laughs> he fed 5,000 people with, with a couple of bread, loaves of bread and a few fish. He raised three different people from the dead in full public view. He's someone who didn't stop at the impossible. He was the first and only man to rise from the dead and leave his grave behind. I think that when we follow Christ, we got to start getting used to doing, making the impossible possible. And when I look at the life of St. Paul, like his greatest champion in there in the Bible, the great evangelizer, I see just a great image of this and a great example. St. Paul was someone who had to stare down impossibilities constantly and then dare them confident in the light of faith that God had given to him, the knowledge of the truth of who Jesus was and what God wanted for this world. He let that guide him instead of his fear that whatever he did would become impossible. And you know what happened? He found a way. He found a way. Well, why do we think that God doesn't want us to do the same thing? It's just that it's easier for us to believe our fears than it is for us to follow faith. It's easier. Yeah, but you weren't made for what's easy. And you didn't get to where you are today by believing what was easy. You got to where you are today by going where no one had gone before and leaving a path behind you. This is the way of St. Paul. This is the way of the Lord. It's the way of us Christians too. Would you like to hear more from Father Nathan? 
Join the St. John Leadership Network and receive a two-minute glance at the gospel every Sunday morning right to your phone. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. So I'm really just enthralled with the figure of St. Paul because he he's someone who's uh, like, obviously his life is writ large in the New Testament. Not only did he write all these letters, right? But he went all throughout the Mediterranean world on at least three missionary journeys that we're aware of. And the Acts of the Apostles is all about his life, right? Is he, he's someone that a lot of attention is paid to. And of course, that's because the Holy Spirit wants us to look to his life and example to teach us about our own and to help us on our own pathway. So when we look at his life, uh, we, we, I'm astounded because it's one of incredible audacity in the midst of very profound personal fragility. And I mean that if you look closely at the writings of Paul, he tells us the ways that he was, he was not always the sharpest knife in the pile or always the most expect, uh, accepted person. He speaks three different times at least uh, uh, referencing his own past in a negative light. He had confrontations with St. Barnabas, with St. John Mark, with St. Peter himself, right? That were not always easy. His personality was one that not everyone got along with. And yet at the same time, look at everything that he accomplished. And, and the reason I bring that out is because I think the Holy Spirit was very forthcoming in putting out St. Paul's weaknesses because he doesn't want us to stop at our own. Every one of us has fragilities. Every one of us has cracks in our, in our clay vessel, right? But yet every one of us, just like St. Paul, holds a treasure in the midst of that cracked clay vessel. And, and that's the beautiful thing about it. What are you going to do to promote the kingdom of God despite yourself? And I think a lot of us are just like, we don't even think about that. I mean, we're, we're just trying to get through the day. And, and that's where I want us to rediscover the power of the dream, right? The power of the fire of the Holy Spirit burning inside of your heart to want change, to want it. it it's a daring thing to even want to be a leader and to make that impact. It's daring because it's scary. There's lawsuits, there's relationships to fraction, there's hard conversations, there's reputations that could be shattered. There's all kinds of different things. And if we've already gone through some of that, we carry baggage, almost like wounds that, that the devil just loves to tickle to keep us where we are. You know, and, and yet we can't just stay where we are. Because if we stay where we are, then we're allowing someone else to, to dictate that terrain. And sometimes we just can't do that. I mean, you can't. you're the head of your family. You're married to that spouse of yours. Uh, you, you're there as a citizen of this country. You're responsible for your business. So it, it's not a question of if. It's just, it's just how to do it. And, and the thing that St. Paul teaches us that's so amazing is that he leans into his weakness to find his way forward. Most of us go around our failures or we go around, you know, the, the places where we're broken in life and we try to do our best despite them. What St. Paul says is, in my weakness, Christ's strength is made perfect. And therefore he says, I will glory in my weakness. It's amazing. So that, so that the grace of Christ might stay upon me. But, the, but that means that to glory in your weakness means that you literally have to stay fit, utilizing the, the weapons, so to speak, that, uh, that are ineffective. Uh, trusting that if God is behind you, no matter what is in front of you will fall, despite whatever instruments you throw at its way. It's really what God's asking us for is courage. The courage to face our fears and to move through them with his grace and his power. That, and that's such a powerful message. And it's, it's what makes St. Paul so irresistible. So when you think about it, well, what are some of the fears that he faced, right? Well, I think the first fear I want to look at is the same one that keeps a lot of us at bay. It's the fear that says, nothing will change anyway. I've tried so hard. And it's like that, that woman who came to see Padre Pio one time and she said, Padre Pio, I've been praying for 20 years for the conversion of my son. And so I'm starting to give up hope. And Padre Pio looked at her and said, ah, oh, my dear friend, I've been praying for some conversions for 20 years, which is why I'm starting to have hope. <laughs> you see, so many of us feel the way, just like that woman, like, well, what's the good in trying? What's the use in trying, right? I already know it's going to end up in failure. 
Uh, the situation around us is so powerful. The forces of evil are so overwhelming that it almost seems like God's just given up on us. And, and I kind of smile when I, when I see it because I can understand that feeling. Look, you know, we've all been there. But is, is it God who's given up on us or is it us who've given up on God? Right? Right? Because, I mean, like, do you really think that God's just there saying, I'm just going to let the world go to waste? Maybe he's like, no, I just thought that I'd find believers who were willing to try in the face of what looks like imminent defeat to win the victory. And of course, he puts in the scriptures all kinds of examples of this, right? From David versus Goliath, just to use that, you know, what <laughs> very flagrant example, to his own son who rises from the dead. You know, as St. Paul will actually put in, his, in Romans 8, I mean, if God is for us, well, who can stand against us, right? Because the answer is, of course, nobody. Because if God is for us, then we have the victory in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen, right? So that means that I have to look at that in the situation in the eye and say, okay, I don't see a way through this, but I'm confident that God is going to show me the way. If I follow the light that's in my heart, the flame of, of desire that comes from him, if I don't let that go, then I know I'm going to find a way. I mean, it's, it's Jesus himself who tells us in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Right? What a great promise. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. It's not easy to hunger and thirst when you don't feel like you have any, any possibility of getting food or water. But Jesus is saying, exactly, stay right there. Stay right there. If you stay there and face that fear, then my Holy Spirit will find you a new way that maybe no one has found before, maybe no one thought of before, but that's there. I mean, let's go back and just look, for example, at the civil rights movement. Who, who led the civil rights movement in the United States of America? Obviously many different people, right? And yet the most prominent person was Dr. Martin Luther King. Who was Dr. Martin Luther King? He was a Christian minister whose faith impelled him to stare down the forces of impossibility and to hold up the candle of truth. And you know what happened? The tides turned. Things changed. Doors opened. And he paid a heavy price to walk through them, to find his freedom and to find the freedom for everybody else. But the courage of that man to believe that some things can change and that it is possible to have a dream, right? And I know there's all kinds of things we can say about every human being about their imperfections, but, but there you had a moment where Christian faith changed the world for the better. Or you could follow the footsteps of St. Damien of Molokai going to the leper colony there in Kalupapa uh, off the northern coast of Molokai where people thought that there was simply no hope for life and where he stepped in and found ways to bring dignity and love to these people who otherwise were abandoned to utter despair. He simply believed his way to a solution because the fire of faith was in his heart. And that fire of faith cannot be extinguished by anything that comes in front of it. This is the same fire of faith that was big, has been given to you. So why look in your family situation? Why look in your marriage? Why look at it from the point of view of saying that there's no way out? When in fact, Jesus always is capable of changing things, making things open that were closed. I mean, do you really think that the one who created all the stars of the heaven and all the universe and all of its finery out of nothing can't change the situation that you're in? <laughs> I think not. I think on the contrary, we'd be well advised to put our hand in his and to brave the fear. And that's exactly what St. Paul does in his life. And we're going to talk about that now. Would you like to start your Thursday mornings with a scriptural leadership lesson? Join the St. John Leadership Network, where Father Nathan hosts a 30-minute call at 6.30 a.m. in all four U.S. time zones. To learn more, go to www. St. John Leadership Network.org slash member and join for free today. So, when I look at the person of St. Paul, I, I see someone who, in many situations in his life, was given a set of conditions that most of us would have considered simply impossible to change 
and which would necessarily preclude him from doing the great things that he actually did, right? And how, what was in his spirit that enabled him to, to do that? I think there was a spirit of creativity, a spirit of, from the Lord who created the world and reflects that creative power in his people as they try to transform it, right? And so I give an example for, you know, number one, the Jewish faith that he was an ardent supporter of had already determined, determined that Jesus Christ was not the Messiah, so it would be, you would say, impossible that a subscriber to Judaism would actually find his way to saying that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of Judaism, right? And yet that's exactly what happened. So I mean, there, there's the first impossibility. How does a devout Jew become a devout Christian when we've already determined, we who are devout Jews, that it's impossible to be a Christian? <laughs> I'm like, well, the way that happened for St. Paul was that he met Christ. That kind of changed things, didn't it, right? And suddenly, when he meets Christ on the, way, on the road to Damascus, uh, in an instant, everything changes in his life. And suddenly, he has a different way of looking at the world. Something that he didn't think was possible to have was granted to him from above because God doesn't belong to this world. God is outside of this world, and he rules the world by intervening in it. So it's a kind, it's kind of, it's a little thing we got to be more confident of as Christians, you know, because so many of us walk around thinking that God doesn't invest in history and that God doesn't intervene in the world in the course of events. And I'm sorry, but it's just not Christian to say that. God does intervene. Well, if God can intervene, then hang on, you know, right? Like there's no wall that's too high. There's no mountain, you know, that's too far. There's no ocean that's too deep. Because if God is in the mix and God can do all things, well, then so can his church. So maybe we just need a different breath of life, maybe a different perspective. Yep, everything is possible, including that a devout Jew become a Christian by meeting Jesus himself, right? It's not the only time he faced that, of course. I mean, you've got the fact that in his life, he repeatedly was met with rejection and with apparent failure. You know, for example, he would go into the Jewish synagogues in the diaspora. So he'd go into these various towns far from Israel where the Jews were gathering to pray and he would try to convert them. But when he would do that, oftentimes there was rejection, sometimes even violent rejection, mobs being formed, people driving him out of town, people beating him, jealousy, you know, accusations, all kinds of things being made against him. Right? So you could say, well, gosh, that system, St. Paul, isn't working because then they would send ambassadors out to the other cities to already tell them that St. Paul had been in this town or in that town and so that the Jews in these other towns shouldn't listen to him. You know what St. Paul does? He, in Corinth, he suddenly just makes a break of it and he says, that's it. I'm not even going to try to go for the Jews to convert you anymore. I'm going straight to the Gentiles. <laughs> I mean, like he just goes around them. Like I said, I'm just going to pray. If you don't want this, then I'm going to go to the Gentiles. Again, like, whoa, you're not supposed to do that, St. Paul. That's not what you've been doing. He pivots. He pivots in a way that opens him to an even greater market. And he finds this, the Holy Spirit leading him there. And he changes the way that he behaves. And he changes his strategy. He moves. And that's something a lot of us are just, it's, it's hard to do, right? Because... You know, sometimes we get more attached to the success that the world grants us and to the, the, what we've already accomplished than we are of the great things that we set out to accomplish in the first place. You almost get satisfied, right, to say, this is good enough. And St. Paul never did that. Um, a, a third time, a third thing that St. Paul had a, a wall around him was literally when he was in prison. I mean, he's under house arrest, you know, being monitored by a guard, he says he's wearing chains. I mean, so that must have been something. I don't know exactly what that meant, but except that he's wearing chains, right? So he's bound. And as he's wearing chains, he's literally dictating letters that we will read today to change the world. If he can't get on boats and go to towns to preach, well, then he'll start writing letters from where he is. <laughs> he will find a way, you know? So there's all kinds of things that get in our way from that. But like you would think that when St. Paul's in prison, there's nothing more he can do. But I'm thinking of the time that he was in prison in Jerusalem, for example. And then, you know, they, or when he was arrested in Jerusalem and then sent into prison. And there he is. He spends years in prison and is given a shot to speak. And instead of defending himself, 
he literally tries to convert the king of Israel who had come to listen to him. And the king of Israel says, I too would wish to become a Christian after listening to this man. He, it's almost like he takes what's impossible and he uses it, leverages it, in order to do something even more daring. And it's the same thing. You can find these examples in the world of business as well. Men and women who are told that it's impossible, it's impossible to cure this disease, and then they find that it is. It's impossible to go to the moon. I mean, how many people would think it's possible to land on the moon? And yet we did it. I think we just have to f- accept the fact that leaders have to stand alone. That the, the, so the source of action and the source of change is the, the burning fire in the heart of the leader. And that other people might not know that. They might not recognize that. They might not even want that. But that other people aren't you, right? You're, you've been called by Christ to dare the dream of heaven, to believe in the kingdom of God, to fight for righteousness and holiness, right? And why would you sacrifice that dream for someone else's mediocrity? I I don't think you should. And I don't think it's what Christ wants from his followers. I think Christ has summoned us to dare great things for him. And that means staring down the impossibilities that are around us, the walls that say no, the, the vortexes that lead inevitably into despair and to brave them for Christ. You say, how do you do that? You do that by faith in the Son of, Son of God who literally walked on water and went through a tomb into the resurrection. And if God is for us, then who can be against us? We lean in on Christ Jesus and with him we then find a way. Deep in our hearts the fire burns and we need to let it out and to follow that flame where it will lead us for the great changes to come. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at communications at stjohninstitute.org. That's communications at stjohninstitute.org. And visit www.stjohninstitute.org and sign up for our newsletter to receive updates from Father Nathan.